Hello, everybody. So I'm here to talk to you about a specific field in robotics called developmental robotics. It can be summarized in a little simpler question, how to teach a robot like a child. At first, I want you to think about a robot. And I'm not talking about science fiction robots. I want to speak about a robot that are already there in the world. The ones that come to mind might actually be a specific kind of robot called industrial robots these big robotic arms walking into factories. You can see them in action. And I have another question. Where are the humans? They are nowhere to be found here, because these robots are working in a factory in a specific setup where everything is known in advance, and they are programmed in advance. If we want to have robots in our home, in our hospital, in order to help us with chores or help us to attend to people, what do we do? We are going to another kind of robotics called social robotics. If it's going. Social robotics is a specific field where actually the robot is among you, is among humans, and he has to interact with them. You can see some examples here on your right. You have the now. For instance, the now can help children in hospital, children with diabetic condition, to do dancing or exercising, having fun. It can also be mounted on top of some uh, wheelchair in order to act as co-pilot and warn you if you have obstacles in front of you or behind you. To the left, you have another humanoid robot called iCub and will follow the trajectory. In that case, the robot will be a companion and he will be able to play with us some kind of different game, musical game or to of annoy. In this specific setup, you have one big question for the robot is the adaptation to the environment. Why? Because we say we want robots in your home. Problem, my home is not the same than yours. If you want to put robots in hospital, the hospital in Lyon is not the same than the hospital in Paris. So we don't know where the robot will be when we code it. The other way is the robot will have to interact with the most complex object in the universe, humans. You will need to be able to communicate with it in order to attend in the most uh, efficient way. And then you will have to be multitask. I want my robot to do my dishes, to clean my dishes. Maybe you want them to do your chores, or I don't know, your laundry. So we'll have to attend different tasks that we might know, but maybe we don't. How do we deal with that? We are taking a paradigm called developmental robotics, where the idea is not to provide a robot, that knows everything. The idea is to provide a robot that can learn everything. A little bit like a child. You provide a robot, and if you need it to do something, you just show him. You demonstrate it. That's a key challenge. So let's take a look at uh, children development studies. What makes infants very good at learning about the world? At first, you might think it's because of the dexterity. You know they are very good at grasping your smartphone and letting you go on the floor in order to learn gravity. But actually, if you look at it and you compare it to our closest cousin, so chimpanzee or orangutan, we're on the same level, more or less, on the dexterity level, on the manipulative level. So it might be needed, but it's not that it. The key concept is in the social domain. Infants are very good to look at another person try to check where that gazing and focusing on that. They are very good at trying to engage people, to communicate with them. And that's very important, because if you want to learn something, you have a, a theory called the zone of proximal development of Vygotsky. It basically says that you can divide your task in three categories. You are the one you can do on your own, but actually you don't learn a lot because you already know how to do it. You have the task, that you can't do at all. It's not possible. And you don't learn so much because you don't manage to do it. The most interesting way, the way you want to learn in order to optimize the learning rate is actually the zone of proximal development. It's all the task you can't do on your own, but you can do if somebody is helping you, if your father or your mother is showing you, is demonstrating something. So that's what we want. And in order to do that, we need to interact with our caretaker. That's what makes humans very unique among social an animals. We are learning a language, and we are able to communicate with others. 
and the other are taking care of the children. In order, after doing that, the children can then acquire capacity, not from random movement, but actually from learning from experts, from their guidance. What do we need if we want to build that inside a robot? The first thing we need is a memory. We need to be able to have the robot not forget everything. If you switch off the robot and it, it loses every information, every knowledge it has, it will not be able to learn. We need after to learn language in order to communicate with humans, in order to learn different objects, different concepts like colors, and to learn different actions to do. And then we need some kind of self-reasoning or planning. We need to be able to give to the robot a capacity to use the knowledge, all the knowledge it just learned, and apply it to a problem or a solution, to create a sequence of action in order to go, to go from point A to point B. So first, let's go back to the neuroscience. What is the long-term autobiographical memory in human? It's the memory that makes yourself a person. It's basically based on two different sub-memory called the episodic memory. It's a memory about a specific event that you can put in a specific place and time. Yesterday, I saw a mouse in my kitchen. That's the episodic memory. And then you have the semantic memory. It's a memory about global knowledge and facts. I know a mouse is a rodent and it's like cheese. I don't know where and when I learned that, but I know it. That's the semantic memory. So we need to build that in a robot. The episodic memory will be a storing of all the data coming from the different sensors of the robot. Tactile sensors, cameras, joint actuators. And the semantic memory will be concept that the robot just learned. Name of human he has to interact with, their preferences. Here you can see the robot doing some movement and storing data inside the database. Uh, it can store different multimodal data, so the camera here that you can see, store also the drone, for instance. And then we are able after to recall this specific event. Do you remember the last time Yan Jing showed you motor bubbling? Yes, it was one month ago. To be precise, it was on January 26th. Actually, I remember. I am visualizing it right now. So now that we have a memory, let's try to learn about language. In order to do that, we need first to learn the grammatical construction of the language. We are building a brain with an artificial neural network, and we're giving as input sentence. You put the toy on the left, and you execute the action. You provide also the meaning, the output of the brain. You do that several times, and the brain will be able to go from one sentence to a specific meaning. I will show you a video of this kind of result. Pay in particular attention to the order of the word in the sentence and the order of the action. During the sentence to execute, or go with train mode. Before you put the violin on the left, Point the guitar. Thinking of the situation. I have understood. I think I have to point guitar. Then I have to put my in left. I will point the guitar. I will put the violin on the left. So at the end, you can see the robot is asking a feedback from the human. Why? Because it's not sure. Because it's not sure about the solution. The human gives a positive feedback. He knows that it, it learns well. So it can use that in order to learn even more. So this learning is not just one step in the, long, in the lifetime of the robot. The learning will happen every time he's doing something. So now that we have a grammatical construction, that's fine. But we still need to find the symbol behind it. What is a toy? What is a box? What is left? We need to create these symbols. That's called grounding symbols. In order to do that, 
both human and robots will go in some kind of joint attention. They will both focus in a specific concept, specific entity in the world. And then the human will be able to provide the corresponding symbol, the name of the object, for instance. Don't attention using pointing on one object in the scene. This is the octopus. I understood this is the octopus. I get it. This is the octopus. So what can we learn? We can learn about objects. We can also learn about the body in order to control the eye cup. Watch, please. I don't move the part of my body. How do you call this part of my body? This is your thumb. Nice, I know that I have a thumb finger. So here we just learned to the eye cup that he has hands with different fingers and we name them. So after we can use that in order to learn actions that the robot can do with the fingers, doing on the fly annotation. I will move my thumb finger. Can you describe the broad actions that I will do? You fold your thumb. You unfold your thumb. You fold your thumb. You unfold your thumb. So we have now very, very simple action, folding and unfolding fingers. But we learn them from scratch. So now, what happens if we want to learn more complex action? We can actually scaffold them. We have creating these blocks, and we can create more complex blocks by assembling different one of them, sequencing them. We are doing that by doing learning by instruction. We will explain the sequence to the robot. For instance, we can teach him how to close the hand, which is basically folding all the fingers. Fold your thumb. I fold my thumb. Fold your index. I fold my index. Fold your middle. I fold my middle. Fold your ring. I fold my ring. So here to fold the hand of finished. Sorry. To fold the hand of the eye cup, he actually has just to bend four fingers. Why? Because the fourth one and the fifth one are actually tied in this robot. The morphology of the robot is important when we teach something to it. So this method can be applied to every robot. That's why it's also difficult. If you have different robots and you want to teach every body part, you have to do it for each robot, each time. It's time consuming. After that, you can also use this uh, closing or opening end to create ever complex action, like counting with your fingers. Show one. Show two. Show three. Okay, so right now what do we have? We have a robot, he has some kind of memory, he learns a language, he learns some action. Are we done? No, we don't. Because the problem is executing an action, knowing how to do an action is not enough. You need to know if you can do it, I can grab this bottle, I know I can. But right now I can't do it, it's too far away. I have some precondition in grasping. If you want to grasp an object, the object should be in your reach. And then you need to understand the effects of the action in the world. If I grasp a bottle, at the end the bottle is not on the table anymore, it's in my hand. And you need to understand this triptych, precondition, action, effect, if you want to be able to plan, and if you have a problem in the world, you have a problem, you want to reach a goal, you need to have a sequence of action that is a link between the current state and the state that I want to achieve. And this sequence of action have to respect their precondition and their effect.
And the robot can do that by observing humans or observing the robot itself, doing action, and checking for regularities. The regularities before an action will be the precondition. The regularities after an action will be the effect. So let's say we want to uh, teach the robot how to play a game, the Tower of Hanoi. So you have to move different circles on different sides, and you have some rules. For instance, you can't move the middle size object if you have the small object on top of it. In the same way, if you have a small object on a location, you can't put the middle. You need to respect an order to create some kind of pyramid. If you do that in front of the iCub, it will record all the data, check the regularities, and learn the rule. You will learn how to move the medium, the big, and the small object into a Hanoi. Then, you have a situation when you have all the objects in the middle, and you say, I want all the objects to the left, but respect the tower of Hanoi rules. And the robot will be able to compute a sequence of action in order to go from this state to the end by linking the precondition and the effect of action. This sequence, this specific sequence of action, has not been shown to the robot. The human just did some movement in Tower of Hanoi, but this solution is not known. It's computed by the robot. It needs a little bit of help. And the last one. Perfect, good boy. So as conclusion, if you want to have social robots, robots that will be able to interact with you, we have taken a developmental approach, meaning that we treat the robot like a child and we try to teach him. The robot has to learn. And we are doing that by using child development theory. We did some kind of hierarchical learning with a human teacher the idea is to first build simple block and then to build on top of it to build more complex ones. Then, robot needs interaction with people. They need to be taken out of the lab, put it into hospital or your home in order to have data, in order to learn about the world. You can't learn the world if you're not in the world. So we need large scale and long term human robot interaction studies in order to develop that. We need to check what happened, what the robot can learn, if not by one day, but for one week, one month, one year of training. If you want your robot to go fetch your beer in your fridge and bring it back to you when you're watching soccer or football, we need that. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for different laboratories that were part of this job uh, all over Europe, so Lyon, London, uh, Barcelona, Sheffield, Lund, and Italia, Genoa. Thank you.